Tell me what you love about Stonebridge. Oh, well, no. Am I in camera right now? I l uh, oh! Uh, I love the people here. The people. The people. Uh, I like the family atmosphere. Um, I love all the activities that they do for the kids and um, how inviting everyone is. It's just a great place. The people. I love all the people. It's a place where you're free to be yourself. The kids learn alongside what we're learning a lot of the time, so then we have something to talk about and then church doesn't stop here. The people. The people. The people. I love how uh, they preach the gospel using the Bible. The people. The people. The people. I love my small group. I love Stonebridge because my kids love Stonebridge. Oh, all the wonderful people. The people. The people. I love the people. I love the people and the music. It's the best. This is where people that care about my kids and my family and just our lives are. The people. The people. The people. And we follow Jesus and we're a Bible-based church. Oh, you know, it's an exciting church. Okay. Uh, I got nothing. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> oh, good morning. Glad you're here. And um, we are in the middle of a message series talking about I love my church. And, and for the last several weeks, we've been really kind of digging into the book of First Thessalonians. And I hope you've fallen in love with this pas passage of Scripture. You know, I love being in ministry, and I've been doing this for a long time. And I get the privilege of doing stuff that I would do for free. I don't tell our elder board that, but I, I love doing ministry. And someday I'm not going to get paid for doing ministry. I'm going to retire, and uh, that'll, be, uh, that'll be great. And then I will get to do stuff I want to do in ministry. And I know, what I, I know I've already picked out my job. I want to be a greeter. I will greet people when they come in. To the, I think that'll be awesome. And I'll stand at the door and I will high five our pastor and I will pray. And uh, occasionally I might, I'd like to serve in the children's ministry area. I think that'd be super fun. Uh, I am not at all interested in working with junior high kids and, and that kind of thing. But I, but I will, I will support our pastors and, and encourage and, and uh, pray and give and I, 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 can't, I really am looking forward to doing it for free. I, I just think that'll be a lot of fun. And, uh, and many of you do ministry for free. You volunteer and you serve and you lead a small group and you work in the children's ministry or you uh, help on Sunday mornings uh, fill in communion trays and, and, uh, and, and you love doing what you do in, in ministry. In fact, you look forward to Sundays and Wednesday nights and it's, just, it's your just favorite time to do stuff because uh, you're giving away uh, your life to the cause of Christ. And, uh, it, you know, I, I think you heard even on the video that, <laughs> and I know, I know you love the pastors here. There's no doubt about it. But what did you hear? I love the people here. It's you. It's you that makes the difference here. It's you that makes the difference. I want you to hear a little bit of the passion that the Apostle Paul had for his little church in Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 13. Finally, when we could stand it no longer, that sounds to me like Popeye, you know, I can't stand it any longer. We decided to stay alone in Athens and we sent Timothy to visit you. And the reason is like we, we didn't know how we didn't know how you guys were doing. We were worried that, th that you might be in trouble. And, and so I'm going to send Timothy to help you out. He's our brother and God's co-worker in proclaiming the good news of Christ. So here Paul is kind of saying, uh, you respect Timothy, you pay attention to him. He's my brother and he is our worker and co-worker here. I just want you to know he has my blessing and he has, um, he has my best interests as well. So here we go. We sent him to strengthen you and to encourage you in your faith, and to keep you from being shaken by the troubles you're going through. But you know that we were destined for such troubles, even while we were with you. We warned you that troubles would soon come, and, and they did, as you well know. That is why when I could bear it no longer, I sent Timothy to find out whether your faith was still strong. It's his major concern. Uh, 
I, I need to know how you're doing. I, not just, not physically. I, I need to know spiritually how you are doing. And I can tell you that nothing gives the pastors here more joy or more concern than your spiritual life. Now, we address physical needs, that's for sure. But, our, you know, our, there are certain things that we, we you know, uh, if, if people are drifting or people are soaring, those gets at our attention. We want to know that. So here he said, I was afraid the tempter had gotten the best of you. Interesting. And that our work had been useless. I mean, horrible thought for Paul to say we poured our lives into you, we poured resources into, into the situation, and in our... It'd be horrible to think that that was just a waste of time. That it was just for nothing. But now Timothy has just returned, bringing us good news about your faith and love. He reports that you always remember our visit with joy and that you want to see us as much as we want to see you. So we have been greatly encouraged in the midst of our troubles and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, because you have remained strong in your faith. Gives us new life to know that you are standing firm in the Lord. How we thank God for you. Because of you we have great joy as we enter God's presence. Night and day we pray earnestly for you, asking God to let us see you again to fill the gaps of your faith. May God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus bring us to you very soon. And may the Lord make your love for one another and for all the people grow and overflow just as our love for you overflows. May he, as a result, make your heart strong and blameless and holy as you stand before God our Father when our Lord Jesus comes again with all his holy people. And amen. Now, obviously, Paul cares deeply for these people. And he knows they're going through a tough time. They're facing persecution. He can't stand it that he's not there alongside, helping and holding them together. Very difficult decision that Paul has to make to send Timothy Timothy was his right-hand man, a valuable partner in ministry, and they, were in, they themselves were struggling. Uh, and, and, but Paul was very concerned that this little group of believers was in trouble. And he wanted to be able to, to find out. So he sends them. In Acts chapter 19, uh, we, we read about how difficult some stuff was going for Paul. It's about that time serious trouble developed in Ephesus concerning the way or the church. It began with Demetrius, a silversmith who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek goddess Artemis. He kept many craftsmen busy. He called them together along with others employed in similar trades and addressed them as follows. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business. But as you have seen, again, this is organized labor, it seems like. Get the people together, let's talk about what the situation is. But as you have seen and heard, this man Paul has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. And he's done this not only here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province. Of course, I'm not talking about the loss of public respect for our business. <laughs> Right. I'm also concerned that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will lose its influence and that Artemis, this magnificent goddess worshipped throughout the province of Asia and all around the world, will be robbed of her great prestige. So here's this guy. He's making a living. He makes little, uh, little shrines or little uh, 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 figurines. And people buy these things. And they, you know, they bring them in their houses. Good luck charm. And... and uh, uh, Artemis was a kind of a combination of the Greek goddess uh, who was uh, Ashtoreth. Uh, if you look this up online, you can go look at what, was, what does this god look like? Uh, it, it was kind of, uh, uh, she had a lot of breasts. There were not two, there was multiple. And it was, you know, it's like, really? You want that in your house or around your neck? Well, they did. They, again, it was a sign of uh, fertility and and uh, blessing, and, and, but it seems odd. He's like, really, you'd want to worship that? But they did. They, it was very important for them. And, and, and again, you kind of think of it as kind of like a touristy situation. Um, you know, they're little shops, and people would go buy them. And maybe they went to the temple, and they thought, you know, if we could bring a little bit of stuff home from our travels. And that's kind of what they did. Recently, Linda and I were in Arizona. We went to Sedona. And if you've ever been to Sedona, it's an absolutely gorgeous place in Arizona. 
Um, but it's also a center for, li- for religious people. It's one of the five vortexes of uh, the New Age movement, and people from all over the world go there and try to connect with God in, in their way, right? And so they're just there, and they worship, and they find out where these places are, and they hang out there. And so there's a, a tremendous amount of industry in Sedona that deals with crystals and rocks and uh, you know, figurines and religious stuff and incense and lots of shops are there and people, I, I went in the shops and people are buying things and, and it would be kind of weird, I suppose, I don't know what the religious climate uh, is in Sedona, but let's just say that the church there got uh, some traction there and there were pastors who were talking about the fact that these little crystals and, and the, the, the vortexes aren't real. They don't really have anything to do with connecting with God. They're just man-made things and thoughts like that. And all of a sudden, people begin to lose business. Christians started saying, you know, I think that's right. I don't know why we would have, why did, why were we buying this stuff? It doesn't make any sense. And they start giving to their church. And, and so I can almost imagine that the community was like, hey, wait, wait, why are you messing with our stuff here? Just calm down. Don't, you know, don't tell people. We know it's, you know, but don't, right? Don't mess with my business. And usually, again, I think people are pretty fine with Jesus until it starts hurting our pocketbook a little bit. People get a little upset about Christians who, who might say, you know what, we're, gonna, we're, we're not going to go to those movies or frequent those establishments anymore. We're, we're just not going to. And so even when Christians would say things like this, I think our government shouldn't be spending money on certain things and artwork or maybe, uh, uh, maybe uh, Planned Parenthood who, who's uh, selling little baby body parts. I don't think we should be doing that. And all of a sudden people are like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's affecting people's money and pocketbooks and livelihood. We like Jesus. Yes, we do. We just don't like him messing with our money. And so that's what was happening here. People didn't really like it. And, and uh, you know, this kind of stuff now happens all the time. Uh, not, only, not only was it happening then, but it's happening now. It used to be when I was a kid growing up, uh, being a Christian was fine. In fact, I would say it was even kind of cool to be a Christian in the 1970s as, as the Jesus movement was really kicking into gear and, and uh, all of a sudden we were breaking out of some t- very traditional worship experiences and Jesus music was taking place and everybody was kind of into that kind of scene and, and uh, great bands and even the Doobie Brothers saying, Jesus is just all right with me. I couldn't believe it. I don't know if that was true with them or not, but, but uh, I, th- I was into it. Now being a follower of Jesus, you get labeled a bigot, and you hate people, and you're intolerant. Heaven forbid somebody might pray at a school function or at a commencement speech, and everybody gets fired up. So it's much easier for the church to lay low and be quiet. Paul said, I'm afraid the tempter has gotten the best of you. And I would probably say the same thing. I'm a little afraid that the tempter or that Satan has got the best of you. And Satan is not, uh, he hasn't really uh, caused you any really like temptation. He's just caused you to be quiet. I'm really sorry. I'm back, 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 back off. There's no doubt that Satan is working over time to silence Christians. And he's doing his best way to get you to take steps backwards. And I've seen many followers of Jesus who are at one time so sold out on the deal. They loved Jesus, they loved others, they loved their Bible, they were generous, they were kind, but things begin to get in their way. Prosperity or busyness or pressure, and they tapped out. It wasn't an overnight thing. I don't think anybody usually wakes up someday and says, you know what, I'm just not going to, I'm not doing this anymore. It was just kind of a, it was a subtle thing. Nothing's more encouraging to a pastor or to a small group leader or to a youth sponsor than when people show up. There's no doubt about it. We, on a Wednesday night in this room when there's a uh, hundred teenagers, there's, a, there, there's just something that happens. But if, but if, but if, something, but if they don't show up, it, I, I can tell you what it does to the heart of a small group leader or to a youth pastor. It just kind of shrivels up a little bit. And we worry because we go, I hope they're doing okay. I hope the tempter didn't get the best of them. 
and the temptations that, are, uh, that those middle school and high school kids are dealing with is, is just enormous. And we know the ramifications of people who, uh, young people who, who take steps away from God at that critical time. It's critical. And it's not about job security for us. It's really about the fact that we know that the tempter is doing his very best to keep us. Right? Now, I love this little passage here uh, in 1 Thessalonians 11 through 13. It says, May, and here's the prayer. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus bring us to you very soon. That's just a simple prayer, right? It, it wasn't, it's not, when you look at that little prayer, you think, well, why did he say that? I mean, that's I know it, but it was just kind of an ordinary thing. It's not, it's not a big deal, right? May the Lord make your love for one another and all the people grow and overflow just as our love for you overflows. May he make your heart strong and blameless. Paul just praying about, uh, you know, he'd like to go. And it's not a big deal. It's an ordinary deal. It's not an emergency. It's not a crisis. It's just a desire that Paul has in his life. He'd like to be able to see them again. It was just kind of a kindness issue there. Too many of us rarely experience the wonder of connecting with God in the ordinary events of our lives. Now, I think a lot of people got religious last night. Right? And honestly, and I never do this, but I prayed to God that we'd win. I'm seriously, I said, please, God, please let us win. I'm in, you know, I'm in my recliner. You know, please just let us win. And I don't know, I don't think, you know, but it, obviously there was a miracle. Right? It took place, obviously, you know. Uh, don't think he got pushed out of bounds, but I, what do I know, you know, so. Amazing thing, though, that we can talk to God at any time about anything. Too many of us know about God, but we rarely experience the presence of God in our lives. We tend to relate more to Bette Midler's song, God is watching us from a distance. We treat God more as a forgiver, right? And we want him to forgive our sins. And we prayed that prayer, hey, God, please forgive me. And, uh, and, and that was a big deal, right? But we kind of treat God as a, as a forgiver. <sighs> then a friend. Thank you for forgiving my sins. I uh, just want to put it out there, God, but that's it. And for most of us, uh, this verse in John chapter 15 doesn't make any sense to us. Jesus says this, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. You are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. We like to relate to Jesus as a friend, but he seems so distant. I think Jesus would explain this. Kind of like this. I, I want to relate to you as a friend. Obviously, I want to be your forgiver, but I want to be your friend. I want to have conversations with you that will bring comfort. I'd like there to be dialogue, some give and take. It's not just you talking with a list of things, kind of like you do with Santa Claus. Here's my list. We don't expect Santa to, to, to respond. We just expect him to do. And oftentimes, I think our prayer life is a lot like the list we give to Santa, Here's what I want from you to do my life. And I, I come with my list and I said, that's good enough. And here you deal with it. And uh, we don't dialogue with God. Throughout the Bible, God wanted his people to know that he was always with them. After the Israelites left Egypt, and even though they were knew that they were free, they were afraid. They had no idea where they were going. They were just going somewhere. They were totally responsible now for their livestock, for their children. Uh, they had no army to protect them. You know, as a slave, you just, you're not responsible for your own livelihood at that point. People, other people are, and so you just do your job. Now God has said, I'm giving you freedom, and you are responsible. And they knew that God loved them because he rescued them, but they could not see him and sense his presence. So God helped him out with that. Exodus chapter 13, verse 21. The Lord went ahead of them, guided them during the day with a pillar of a cloud, and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. 
This allowed them to travel by day or night. If they had any doubts about the presence of God, they, all they had to do was look up. There was the cloud. There was, a little, there was a fire, and it showed them the way. If they ever grew frightened, they just had to look up. There was this pillar that, that, that cast this glow over the whole camp. And I think some of us think, yep, yep, that's what I need. I need a little pillar of fire or a little cloud you know, kind of just guide me throughout the day. And then I would know that God is with me and I would know if I'm going the right way or not. Because if, if all of a sudden I turn this way, God, the little pillar would be like, no, 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 come over here. And, no, 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 come over here. And oh, yeah, I should be right here. You know, and, and if I turn my back on God, the little thing would come around and like, whoa, 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 you're going the wrong way. I don't know, but it's, oh, no, let's go this way. Wouldn't that be kind of fun to see? Like, uh, if everybody in the world, ha you know, who were godly people who wanted to follow God, says, God, I, uh, you know, and so he just clicks on the pillar light or the fire light, and everybody has one, and we're all, you know, <laughs> I just think that would be kind of funny uh, to see wh where God would lead us all. Uh, and it's like, where are you going? I'm just following this thing. I don't know, you know, and, and okay. Uh, I think it'd be kind of interesting to see what that would do, but... Uh, like a little GPS that keeps us on track. Always kind of reprogramming us. No, 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 no. Yeah, oh, yeah, you're going the right way. Matthew 1, 23 says, Look, uh, the virgin will conceive a child, she'll give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So you don't need a pillar and you don't a fire or cloud. God's presence is with us. John 1, 14, the word became human made his home here. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. The presence of God was a person, and that person had conversations with people, and people knew him, and they followed him, and they knew wherever he would take them, they would be okay because he was with them. And because these people lived with Jesus, it transformed these ordinary sinful people into people who changed the world and made things new jesus knew that someday he wouldn't be here and he also knew that they would we wouldn't be able to sense his presence like we like when he was here how do we know john 14 and i will ask the father and he's going to give you another advocate who will never check this out never leave you he is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. God created people for relationships. And the very first thing he said to people, it's not good for you to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. And we have friends and colleagues and children and spouses and no matter how great those are, even the best friends can't be with us all the time. They move away or fade away, pass away, don't always understand what's going on. And sometimes they vacate our lives when things are tough and bad. I don't, have you had, I don't know if you've ever had friends that when things got tough, they left. Jesus doesn't. His spirit is with us. His presence is with us. And he gives us little signals, little promptings. It's not a, it's not a little you know, cloud. It's not, you know, it's not a little thing of fire. He, but he does give us promptings, and you've probably sensed those at times. It has nothing with, about going to church. It has nothing to do about being on our knees. It just happens to be that we would be sensitive to his voice every day. Ministry and life is an adventure. Sometimes it's hard to sense the presence of God in our ministry and in our life. It does begin with prayer. You can enjoy God and feel his companionship and his compassion and his strength. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 17. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. I think one of the benefits of that kind of relationship with Jesus is, is not only am I aware of God's presence, his presence makes me more aware of other people. We saw that and he says, uh, may the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow and overflow just as our love for you overflows. I think the closer we get to God, the closer we'll get to people. 
closer we know God, the better we know God, the better we're going to understand people. It's kind of funny to me to think that we can love God and not have much of a relationship with people. The more I get to know him, the things that matter to him, he begins to change me. So Paul's heart is tuned into the people of God, and he wants their hearts to be strong and brave and blameless. So let's try this. Let's just talk to God about anything. No magic formulas, no magic words, no real agendas. And maybe for the first time, you begin to sense the presence of God in your life. You're just going to talk to Him. And for some of you, it might be a little easier just to write stuff down. Some of you might like to journal some stuff and journal your prayers. I think that's wonderful. I don't do that. I, I've had a lot of people tell me I should. And, and I said, well, you're not my teacher. I, my third grade teacher made us do that stuff. I don't, my mom made me do stuff like that. I don't like doing it. It doesn't work for me. But it might for you. You just begin to have... Con- I, I, my prayer time now is mostly a pretty constant, all-day-long kind of thing for me. It starts really when I get up. I have conversations with God. One of our... Uh, kid men pastors I don't know if she still prays this way um, but this is how she started her every prayer when she was in my small group hi God (laughs) and I would chuckle a little bit I thought that was kind of funny but she prayed that way I giggled and I came to realize that her relationship with God was one of joy and adventure and companionship and it was and maybe that would be a great way for you to start your prayer hi God There's much to be done in kingdom work. And we want you to be strong and courageous. We don't want the tempter to get the best of you. So stay connected with the church and with our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Thank you that we have a relationship with you. Not just when we come to church here. Not just in this room. at any time we need you. We do sense your presence from time to time. I know that there's moments when it feels a lot, we feel a lot closer to you. but uh, And I do. I know I do feel that when I come into this room and with these people and with the moments of communion and the chance to connect with you in those, in, you know, by giving and, and uh, singing. And, uh, but I have so appreciated your companionship this whole week. I need thee every hour. Stay close. In Christ's name, amen.